So the subject I believe is can fate be changed, right? That's the subject. And um, before we come to can fate be changed, we can have a series of questions uh, connected with fate. The first question that strikes us is, uh, you know, these series of questions we, we need to ask about everything. Uh, that's how I was taught in medical school. What, when, where, how, <laughs> why. <laughs> if we answer these questions, uh, we'll find many mysteries solved. So one is, what is fate? So normally we, when we speak of fate, we regard as a situation or a circumstance. Now, is that really fate? That's just the outer face of fate. And we very often judge it as good or bad, uh, which obviously good and bad, pleasant, unpleasant are merely reactions of our surface nature. This much is very simple to understand that probably there is nothing like a good and bad fate. Uh, and in fact, as we go deeper and deeper, we may realize the meanings change completely. You know, that famous story which I uh, often love to recount of the uh, Mughal Empress whose a lovely Chinese mirror got broken by a servant and the servant wanted to recount it to her but knew that this means I am going to be hanged now or my head is going to be chopped off. She was a new servant. So she tells her that Begum, she shai chin shikast, the mirror which was so precious is broken. So the queen, the empress was quite a mystic in her predisposition. She pauses for a while and while this servant lady is waiting with her head hung for the next stroke, she says, Khub shud, wonderful. Samane khud bini shikast. The object which used to flatter my ego and tie me to my appearances is broken. You see, the, the way one looks at fate changes based on the perspective. So what may appear as, um, you know, many of these people, the, the other day I am watching this wonderful serial, very old serial, Chanakya. I don't know whether some of us have seen it. The old one, not the Chandragupta. No. Beautifully made. It's not just a story about Chanakya, but a glimpse into Indian life as it would have been. Beautifully done. And there you see how these two people, the protagonists, both Chandragupta and um, Chanakya himself, how they are moved by adverse fate towards the greatness that they would one day become. So, very often when we look at situations and circumstances as a slice in moment of time, we miss out on a much greater plan and picture and by our reaction and responses may actually work against the ultimate truth that is going to unfold itself. So, one of the definitions that Sri Aurobindo beautifully gave, speaks of fate in several places in Savitri, uh, Savitri incidentally is about conquering fate. So, you know, the answer is very obvious, but, but how and that we'll come to. So, he says, uh, O fate, uh, O king, the event that made thee on thy road are not the fate, are not thy fate, things that meet us on the road. So, what is thy, thy fate? He says, fate is truth working out in ignorance. Fate is a transaction done at every hour between thy soul and nature. There is deep within the story of fate is being woven. And what we are seeing on the surface are just a cipher of subliminal quiverings. It's me who chooses my fate but not this me as we understand. But deep within the soul is choosing. And how it is choosing? In, in one line he summarizes it so beautifully. It's a transaction done between thy soul and nature. You know, the soul has got it inscribed within that this is what it will be. And nothing can stop it. So there is that ineluctable aspect of fate that there is something it must express and manifest. But then it has also got nature and the play of nature. And while we keep on thinking it's my nature, this nature, nature is a vast field where all kinds of forces are brewing and working. And sometimes they seem to work against what one is born with, like imagine when Pandavas were born and somebody would have predicted, you know, they are going to be king. <laughs> they would have said, what kind of king? We are born in the forest and when we come back, we are treated like abandoned children. But even things that oppose, they 
conspire towards the same great end. So this is how Shobindo uh, reminds us. Shobindo's whole yoga, the beauty is, is based on oneness, not binaries. Even though we see the binaries come here and there, but eventually everything is conspiring towards that one great end. We see Shobindo's own life when he was in Alipur jail. He gets the vision of Vasudeva everywhere, and one of the things that um, Shri Krishna Vasudeva, the Amen and Divine, reveals to him. He says, uh, look, you know, he, he says that even their understanding is in my grasp. Not only your lawyer, I am there even in the lawyer who is working against you. I am there in the judge. I have become the bars. And why I have got you here? Because there is a greater work I intend you to do. So this is a preparation for that. It's not a punishment because Sri Aurobindo raises this question while in the jail that I had asked your protection till the time that... India gets freedom. I didn't want anything else. And why am I here? And he is just, he is about to change his field of action and his means of action. And therefore, he is brought into the jail. So there is always behind all these events and circumstances, several layers. And when we rush at appearances and say, oh, bad fate, oh, good fate, good fortune, misfortune, it only betrays our ignorance. And we should pause and step back and look at events how they unfold. The same thing applies when we speak about time and space. So the next question is when and where? Is it something fixed that this is the spot where it is going to be or this is the time that it is going to be? All that we can say is that there are moments of time when there are certain forces which are very active. We know this, uh, uh, you know, morning when we wake up, most of us by and large are full of hope and enthusiasm. And by the time it is late evening, especially, you know, night, if one is alone, one is suddenly, uh, all kinds of thoughts are coming to the mind. Observe the difference between day and night, Gita speaks about it. At a larger scale, there are cycles of time when uh, things seem to work in a certain way, as if everything is going smooth. And there are spaces of time when everything seems to grate and obstruct. And um, what is the reason behind it? We need to ask, is it just some kind of Rahu Ketu going along or is something deeper? Uh, in, in context of the ashram life, there used to be, when people came to the ashram, there used to be something which uh, later on, not earlier, after 47, when people's uh, uh, teachers started coming, mother gave a very nice passage on an advice to newcomers. And she says, when people come for the first time, they are full of joy, full of, the psychic is in front. So everything is beautiful. Everybody is a saint. And every time you eat food in the dining room, ah, this is celestial. But she says, after a while, you know, this thing between soul and nature. After a while, the nature part takes over, the old nature returns. It says, no, look at this man, he is so crazy. Look at that person, how he behaves. Look at this person, how he spoke to me. So we, instead of looking at ourselves, which is the fundamental necessity of any <laughs> inner life, we start looking at everybody and everything around. And then the same life begins to uh, appear to us as something horrible or difficult or challenging. Then mother says, what is the remedy? She says, the remedy is to get back to the psychic. So if we look at the same phenomena from another poise, we see a different picture. And when we look at from this poise, there is a different picture. I often give this example because people sometimes come and say, Oh, we thought ashram is a utopia. <laughs> same thing I think they talk about Auroville. I said, yeah, it's a utopia, but you add to it, it's a utopia in the making. And you are one of the builders. So now that people don't want. We, I want to step into a comfort zone where everything is wonderful. I just want to have an Arab spring, sit there in nice couch and enjoy life. That's the, our idea of utopia. The problem is even if such a utopia existed, we won't enjoy one bit of it if we have not labored and are ready for it. And um, one of the um, things I remember from my own real life experience was when I landed in Leh, one Air Force duty for CHN, and the first stop was at Leh, which is at 11,500 feet. So it's a beautiful space. Um, it must go one, once, you know, at least. Himalaya is amazing. You know, every piece of Himalaya is so different. So this is barren Himalayas, not a single vegetation. 
So when I landed, um, got down from aircraft, amazing sight. It's a utopia. I can't imagine, you know, that somebody is paying me to go and stay there for three months. Strangely, it was a kind of punishment because I had opposed my commanders for something which he had done. So I was sent there. I didn't know it's a boon. So when I go and I see so lovely. So I walked up to the telephone booth, which is just from here to the wall out there and end of this room. And as I picked up the phone to inform that I have come, I became breathless. I had read everything about, uh, you know, high altitude problem and everything. Now, my senior told me, just stay put. I am going to come. Don't move anywhere. And for two days, I couldn't enjoy a l even a little piece of that wonderful scenery. Everything was wonderful, but I didn't enjoy it. But after two days, I started enjoying it. It was something beautiful. So many times in this um, play of life, game of life, if we are not ready, if we are not prepared, you know, there is a nice aphorism of Sri where he says, God is a cruel uh, torturer, something like that. And you don't understand it unless you understand Krishna's play. So Krishna, he speaks about Krishna. Krishna is, he tortures us, <laughs> even in who there is a line like that, that he, he tortures us. Why does he torture? So mother gives a very beautiful commentary. She says that, well, when we don't know the play, when we are not prepared for the play, it's like suddenly landing up in the middle of a football game and, you know, we feel, oh my God, I don't know the rules of the game. They are kicking the football or they are kicking me, we don't know. But when we begin to understand the play and when we know the rules of the game, when we are prepared for the game, so the same football where people fall, where they are sent out, red card, yellow card, everything is a joy. The player who is playing is just enjoying that game. It's not about winning or losing. Winning or losing is for the sattabaj, who are, you know, who have put stakes. But for the player, it's a joy. So it depends on the poise. So this is another aspect because a lot of time when we speak about changing fate, it's because we have a misconception about fate. If we had the right attitude, the right vision, the right perception, the right approach, probably we will just accept fate and go through it knowing that it is a grace. There is a very nice conversation of the mother where she speaks about acceptance and change. So she says, you know, there is one attitude which is adopted by mystics about ex accepting things as they come. And um, it it's empowers us in a certain way because, you know, then whatever happens, comes, we take it as a grace and we receive it and, and it turns out to be a blessing. As the mother says, whatever happens in life, take it as a grace and it will turn out to be so. She says, on the other hand, there is a contrary tendency in human being which is also necessary. It's the urge for progress. Progress comes by changing things. So if I accept everything just as it is, I don't have a will for change. On the other hand, I want to change things. And when we want to change things, we become sometimes activists and uh, all the various ways, revolting uh, angels and various ways we try. And she gives a very simple um, solution, a two-step formula. She says, first learn to accept. It gives the strength, the power and um, it eventually releases the energy that can change things. We are in a hurry to act, hurry to change things. So she says acceptance empowers. It's, we must change things, but first we must accept. And when we accept things, we endure it and yet keep the faith intact. Then after a while, we see that the will becomes stronger and stronger and that energy can have the impact which can change things. So it's a two-step process, whereas very often we just revolt, we just, we have never practiced acceptance. Uh, we just are all the time wanting to change situations, circumstances. So what do we really change? We only change appearances. So this question uh, used to come to my mind that if fate is um, fated, as they say, then what about the number of people who have smallpox has been eradicated? And what about medical science? It is curing many things. And this question used to come to me as a doctor, young doctor. You know, I thought in the omnipotence of medical science. But slowly I discovered something very strange. That it's so strange that medical science has advanced seemingly over 100 years at least, more than that. But why is the need of more and more hospitals? The number of doctors per 
patient is increasing. Uh, I mean, we need more doctors. We are, we are always running short. In Pondicherry itself, I think there are seven or eight medical colleges. And it speaks very poorly of the medical system itself. It means we have not found the clue. So what we are doing, we are curing, but we are simply changing appearances. We are curing one thing, but that energy of illness is taking another route and expressing itself in another way. My own impression is that many of the modern diseases, including maybe um, HIV and uh, autoimmune disorders, may well be simply because we have eradicated one thing, but not created the inner balance. So that imbalance is coming up in form of other kinds of other manifesting in other ways. Today we call them autoimmune dis disorders. Take for instance allergy. Uh, when I went to um, Australia, they were saying one of the things which is very common here is allergies of various kinds. Food allergy, gluten allergy, milk allergy, all these things. So I was wondering why it is so. Of course, I have my own understanding about it. And I discovered that um, I hope there is nobody from Australia here. Okay, yeah. Please, <laughs> anyway, something like, I discovered that, uh, you know, there is a past and everybody, there is a certain degree of isolation among groups of humanity because of a very gory past. And there is a tendency for people to stay in groups. It's like, it's reassuring. It's uh, unlike, let's say, place like America or, you know, other places in Europe. So it's not about racism. It's something else which is there. And, uh, and my own immediate uh, sense was that this kind of a feeling of isolating oneself. Also this kind of a transportation of an entire different kind of um, set of humanity which belong to a different soil onto another soil. That soil has its own way of uh, not revenge but getting back. The strange part was that most of the aboriginals don't suffer from these allergies. So you know this thing that you belong to a certain soil, you belong to a certain climate and you suddenly go to a place, you have transported yourself and force yourself in another place. But, well, the soil knows that your body doesn't really belong to. Maybe after four generations, five generations, it may get adjusted. So it's a complex of forces, complex forces, number of forces which are moving us at many levels. And while materially we may change things, let's say with medicines or other things, but the energy which is inside will take another route. Meaning thereby we haven't really changed fate, we have simply altered its course and uh, you know it has taken different appearance. So this is something very often I find in, uh, in, in my medical practice. So this is about uh, just the external part of fate. So then again, uh, if this is how fate is, it's a play of complex forces, is there any way that we can alter it? Well, as we have seen, when we are caught up within it, if I am caught up in a whirlwind, if I am caught up in a storm, if I am caught up in a whirlpool, I may cry and shout, but I am going to drown nevertheless. This doesn't help. One thing which um, repeatedly and mother reminds us that when we just keep complaining, grumbling, it brings in all kinds of adverse forces. You know, it's like they are watching and when they see that I am crying, they enjoy this scene. It's a very sad thing. There are forces which enjoy this. You know, it's, it may sound very strange, but we as human beings, just like we enjoy horror movies, so there are forces which enjoy, they like us to cry and when we cry they say, oh good, so they gather and when they gather they make things worse. So first thing we have to understand is that if I cry, complain, grumble, shout, scream, it's not going to change things. It's only going to make my situation worse. What do I do? I must discover that plane where I am empowered. So there are various ways. One is I must come out. Now what does one do when one is caught up in a whirlpool? One seeks help from someone who is out of the whirlpool. And what that person is not caught up, he has to find ways and means to pull me out. Now it's so strange that in as we grow up with our um, sense of individuality and separateness, we often find it very difficult to trust that there is something or someone out of the whirlpool. And hence we uh, call everybody except the one who is out of the whirlpool. <laughs> so, you know, we call our friends this, that, uh, 911, 108, all these numbers. 108 I like. In India we use the word one, uh, number 108 to call ambulance and everything. It's very holy number. 
So if nothing else, one zero eight. <laughs> Remember, you are calling God. In any case, you start with one. In US, it's nine one one. You end with one. So remember one if nothing else call the one he is all the time present and he will find ways and means he is outside the whirlpool calling somebody who is you know like people go and ask their friends in the same age group okay tell me i am having this problem what can i do about it so friend gives some solution makes things more complex often i have met people who said you know what i have been able to guide my friends but when it came to me i am not able to help myself so can you just help me i said well it doesn't work like that because um, we are all caught up in that whirlpool we don't have that vision when we have that vision when we have that power probably none of this will be needed i remember a story about nalini da when someone went he was for two months suffering from uh, you know a lot of issues related to a, a number of events and he was burdened couldn't sleep couldn't uh, think with clarity so one day he just went to nalini da and said i am having all this trouble and i need some answer so nalini da said okay okay you write your uh, things and come and give it to me so next day he wrote 35 page letter long letter all the problems all the issues and he walked into nalini da's room and it looked as if he has forgotten also he said nalinda the letter is oh yeah okay he took the letter gave a blessing packet and said go so <laughs> he expected he will read the letter and probably you know explain each point look you know when you have this you should do this you know philosophy what the gita says what this is. he said go now he doesn't know he is waiting he said yes go so he describes this man that i turned Uh, maybe with a half heavy heart but as i cross the threshold that um, uh, chokhat the door he says suddenly i discovered as if the whole load has been taken away he says i am trying to now recollect he wants to bring it back and can't bring it back now you know this is a kind of intervention which is possible now he could do it because he is outside the sphere of fate outside the sphere of this play of cosmic forces he may still come into it and take the play part of the play the poison that comes out of the play this is another very interesting story about nalini da when he had a uh, you know seeming heart attack and the story dilip da was recounting me that he was sitting and uh, thinking at you know while nalini da was resting at night he was sitting on duty and he was thinking why someone like nalini da should have a heart attack so um, thinking of this dilip da dozed off and then suddenly he says that i woke up and uh, nalini da was looking at me intently and he doesn't know what 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 has happened so nalini da simply says you know it's global global karma global karma <laughs> and then again went back and then it struck him that this is a conscious and willful act of taking upon oneself the miseries you are not in it you don't have to take it yet you take it you know we we see in shubhendu's own life when shubhendu is uh, the last um, few days or few hours when doctor said this is because of this this condition and what they labeled as coma so you know dr sanyal writes that it's so strange niruddha writes this is we all know even a first medical graduate knows that well from this kind of coma you don't come back several times shubhendu would come out and he would open his eyes and ask the time ask for water and toward the end half an hour before he embraces uh, champaklal several times calls nirod just by the name he says what kind of situation is this <laughs> it's like his yogic shakti is completely free of this material case but he doesn't want to use it because it's another leela which is going on but then if he wants he can still use it overpass that uh, you know realm of destiny or determinism and come and change it so there is something called as an intervention which we can call from above which can change the course of things there is a very you know the gita speaks of four kinds of bhaktas one of them is arth when you just call in distress and i had a very living experience of this what this arth could be and it can change things which are absolutely inevitable you know i can share it's a very personal experience but very 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 engaging so my wife was going to come for a blood test to ashram nursing home and um, it's 8 and i'm waiting she has not come so i am 
you know, I tried to call her, but no response. I took it that, you know, she, she doesn't usually bother about the phone. So maybe, but something within me is very uncomfortable. And look how freedom and fate, grace and fate, they work, run together. Then after 10 minutes, when I'm inwardly very restless, I see um, someone shouting from the door of nursing home, uh, Alok bhai, Kavita. So I just, what happened? Kavita was to come, but what's the anguish in the voice? Baby Di was there. And when I come out, I see that she's all like a, you know, bundle of nerves, all, you know, that uh, where am I? All confused. And I had literally carry her. So what had happened was she had met with an accident and she had fallen unconscious. Um, strange part is that right behind her auto rickshaw comes. And I read this story now so easily and it shows the entire, the way fate works. So, right behind her and there is somebody who looks at her she is wearing a sari but strangely thought that you know she is ashram ashram take her to ashram nursing home now normally you would take her to general hospital or some place where she will be lost you know she was in coma so nobody would know I, I would probably think that she doesn't pick up the phone maybe you know uh, she just dropped the plan something like that but she is brought there now at the ashram nursing home door the man who is there thinks she is just uh, some outside patient and keeps telling her, uh, telling the auto rickshaw, no, 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 you take to GHN while I'm sitting there. And baby D at that point of time is stepping out and looks at her and says, Are, this is Kavita. Now, that one moment and things would have changed. He would have just taken her again to nursing or to uh, GH. But the amazing part was when she steps inside and I see her situation, like in art, I pray to the mother, mother, she must be saved. And I still remember it was like a dialogue right here above my head. What if it is her fate to leave the body? And I say, Mother, there is nothing greater than you. You need to change this fate. What if her soul has chosen? It's the second. I said, doesn't matter. You can alter the soul's choice. And I don't know how I was just because I was not in a position to react. So everybody had come, gathered, they were taking care. I said, I just need to sit and pray. After that, the series of event, all the CT scan, everything, and every doctor was saying, we don't know, it's like as if something which would have just seven fractures inside the skull, several bleeding spots. They said, just it is stopping at a crucial point. Now, personally to me, it was an intervention. Now, with this dialogue which went on, just two, two uh, clear uh, sentences, voice, you know, speaking, uh, which I take it as mother's voice, um, or the voice of destiny if you like that what if and I am addressing it as mother that look you know uh, doesn't matter her soul may choose to leave but you can intervene and change things so there is a state but I think this state cannot be imitated you, we can't because I have seen that trying to intercede sometimes uh, it doesn't work uh, because I am not feeling deep inside that kind of connection so art I mean in the sense that kind of movement the state of art has to be there inside it's not which can be just practiced. Okay, somebody, is, let me make an art prayer. It's not something external. It's not an outer um, anguished state. It is a very different state. Maybe inwardly there is a zone in which we enter where there is peace but intensity. Two things coming together. And then there is something goes because it's deep, deep connection and uh, then there is an intervention. So this is one kind of, and so beautifully we have in Savitri, a prayer, a master act, a king idea can link man's strength to transcendent force. Then miracle is made the common rule. So a prayer, master act, a king idea, these can change destiny because they connect us to the transcendent. Something which is out of this realm and that can extend a hand and help us. But this doesn't happen, you know, as often we would like it to happen. Partly because, well, I think every day we need to connect it to it. It doesn't work out that suddenly one day I wake up. And it doesn't even work out if every day I am connecting, thinking one day when I need. So, you know, people break coconuts in front of Ganpati that one day when I need, Ganpati will come to help. He may not be finding it very amusing to break coconuts in front of him. I don't know. God's poor fellows have to bear all this human sacrilege. <laughs> But it happens when we have formed a certain degree of link. Maybe it can happen without it. We don't know ways of God. But Sri speaks about these three things. One is the law of karma, meaning thereby we are caught in the trap and it unfolds in its own way. 
most of us come in that most of us most of the time let's put it come in that little trap hole we are in the storm our eyes are blinded we cannot see and we want to do things we knock at this door that door but we don't know how to open it this is very unfortunate and that's why mother says you must you have, you are given the key to open the door you must enter practice entering there then when there is a storm you can enter otherwise suddenly when there is a storm you are looking for you know uh, you know like some of us i mean me included going out and suddenly i say that you know um, let's go and have an ice cream and then i realize i haven't kept my purse because i i'm not in the habit of keeping my purse so it's it's you want to have something but you don't have the you have also the means but you have never got into the habit of um sitting and going within and getting in touch with that that power within us which can tilt the balance it's like drop these earth prayer uh, as long as she is depending on her husband the five powerful husband and everybody it doesn't work but the moment she gives herself completely to the one who is residing in her own heart that's where faith counts because she calls the divine also with many names somebody who is out there out there but when she calls the immanent divine oh thou who art seated in my own heart that's when suddenly a higher destiny intervenes so second thing shobindo says is compassion where the divine compassion leans into the net extends a hand and makes it little more softer and smoother and third which shobindo says the greatest of all is grace it doesn't act according to any logic you know it will uh, use anything and everything for the means of her progress the story of bilbo mangal we know his name was um, mangal and he he was a fellow his father was a nice guy he was also very interesting but he led a very um, strange kind of life later he became a pandit and then he became um, you know very much uh, enamored uh, with a lady whom she married and he was so intoxicated with the beauty that once when the river is in spit he crosses it and then in the flash of a lightning sees a rope climbs the rope and while crossing the river uh, he is holding on to a boat and crossing it and then he holds a rope and crosses and then his wife sees him all drenched all torn and she says what is it she says i am in love with you so she comes out and sees that it was a dead corpse which he had held and it was not a rope but a poisonous snake she says are you mad if you would have loved krishna like this <laughs> you would have got free <laughs> you are loving this body which is nothing but like a dead corpse it will be one day this dead corpse and you don't understand this and those words change his destiny you see sometimes shobindo says a casual passing phrase can change our life he could have taken recourse to you know you don't understand my love i am hurt i am broken and god gone you know probably filed a divorce suit uh, this woman doesn't um, care for my love gone into depression started listening to songs of mukesh to feed his ego that's what we do know when we are hurt we listen to songs which make us more depressed so strange I, i don't know this is something very strange i have not really understood but people do it or they will go to somebody who say very sorry so bad thing happened that man that woman doesn't deserve your love you know all these things which will feed our ego we want to hear those words somebody saying you are right you know you are a, but he takes it he takes those words as if coming from god that is the difference he takes those words as if coming from god and at that moment there is a apocalypse moment and he starts praying to krishna and uh, of course he is regarded as one of the greatest of bhaktas bilva mangal one of the stories where a man radically changed his nature he went to an extreme so here we also see in this story something very interesting Uh, if we go to the extreme of something and that's how i look at some of these stories of bilva mangal jagai madai uh, augustine that when somebody goes to the extreme of something he is very close to probably opening a door there is something which is going to burst forth and beyond it the same secret lover is waiting with his arms outspread even in the densest darkness so this is a very uh, wonderful thing to remember that every place he can intervene so this is one intervention second is what can change fate something which is chosen 
Now that is the secret psychic entity that has the ability to change things. It has the ability even to accept things. It has the ability to align itself to the will of the divine. And then it may discover as it does very often, ah, but I chose for this. So what we think is something which is uh, bad, something which is good, our whole perspective changes because we start looking at it from uh, the psychic soul's perspective. So these are the two levers which surely can change things. One is if we go and touch our own core, that magic space where love abounds and we, we may use the word soul. And the other is when we go beyond this fear uh, and touch something of the eternal. These are the two powers that can change destiny. But short of it, when we are in, in, caught up in the play, we may scream and do this or that, it doesn't help. It only wastes and throws our energy. Is a very another very interesting story um, of Ruru and Pramadwara. Shobindo is immortalized in his poem Love and Death. So when Ruru is with all his anguish, he is going all over the world that my wife has died and she has died prematurely and it shouldn't have happened. Why did the gods do it? And he is, you know, full of that anguish and pain. Then at one time, because he is moved ultimately by love, the god of love appears before him. And tells him, you know what, all these tears is not going to help you. What do the gods want if you want to change their dest your destiny? Say sacrifice. It's a very amazing um, story where he has to sacrifice half his life, which is not just about half his life, but all the experiences that would have made him grow. So is there something like a conjoined destiny? Over decades that I have seen through stories unfolding, I have this feeling that yes, destinies can come together. It may not be always so common, but destinies can come together. In any case, two people who tend to live very intimately begin to share the destiny. There is something they as if call common play of forces. And it can be amazing. That's how, you know, they, of course, it described as some twins, uh, you know, how sometimes it is seen that twins actually share some similar experiences. Uh, there is an amazing story of some of the twins dying together on the same day in the same way, just a couple of hours apart. Now, when there is this intimacy, we begin to draw the same kind of forces, similar kind of forces around us. And in a certain sense, we link our destinies. But it also means that if one person can go beyond this realm, then he can also help the other person go beyond. And that is what the master does. What does the master do? How does he change our life? He connects on one side with that which is beyond. On the other side, he connects with all of us. At one place, Shubhinda says this about the mother. The mother unites with everyone, all of you, and takes upon herself all the burden that others are suffering. At one place it says there is not a single illness with which she has not suffered. And that is how she changes because by doing it, she mixes her being with ours. But within she is always herself and infinite. And that's how she can change destiny. So these are just some of the thoughts and um, we have 15 minutes for questions. Let me just read a few lines from Savitri before we just stop. This on page 52, the secret knowledge. All that transpires on earth and all beyond are parts of an illimitable plan. So this tendency to look at things in sections. This happened to me. What happens to me has its repercussions on others and so on and so forth. So it's an interconnectedness. Very often when someone dies or passes beyond, People feel sorry for the person. No, the person who has passed away has passed away. He is now going to come in a new body in a new place. It's, it's grieving for that person has very little meaning if we really look at it. But what does one grieve for? For those who are left behind. Because they are attached, they cherish the memories. They are going to live with this pain. 
सो इट्स नॉट दैट समबडी पास अवे उनका साथ बुरा हुआ उनका साथ तो यू नो ई इज गॉन ई इज गॉन ऑन इज फॉरवर्ड जर्नी बट दो लेफ्ट बिहाइंड विल सफर सो एवरी इवेंट हैज इज इज इंटर कनेक्टेड विद एवरी थिंग एल्स the one keeps in his heart and knows alone our outward happenings have their seed within and even this random fate that imitates chance this mass of unintelligible results are the dumb graph of truths that work unseen the laws of the unknown create the known and several places in savitri Shubhendu describes the zones of consciousness, and in each zone, how a certain kind set of determinisms begin to apply. If we are caught up in, let's say, become a plaything of the lower vital zone, we become very prone to various kinds of things, various kinds of illnesses. If we rise above, we are caught up in another, let's say, the uh, intellectual zone, zones of music, zones of emotions, zones of various kinds. So, but. different types of determinism begins to apply and uh, if not completely changed it overrides there are people who on their death bed can still wake up and as if stall death because they have uh, they have suddenly connected a zone which is not the transcendent but at least it is a higher determinism so this is the second part of it where even when we cannot completely change we still can deflect it we still can slightly change it the events that shape the appearance of our lives are a cipher of subliminal quiverings which rarely we surprise or vaguely feel are an outcome of suppressed realities that hardly rise into material day that's why we should be so conscious of even our hidden thoughts often i have seen people going through autoimmune problems and other things i have asked them sometimes did you have a death wish sometimes we uh, say yeah i mean after much it's not like you can't ask right away <laughs> patient comes with some pain and you say do you have a death wish but there is a moment when you feel the person is ready and you are ready and you ask this and the person says yeah maybe i'm not fully satisfied and happy with my life i have seen uh, i have read a very nice story about a lady who had fourth stage cancer all spread and so they were doing an experiment on her with lst because you know you can do it only when somebody is sure to die and in lst she went into a state of altered consciousness and then she was carrying a baby in the womb and the doctor asked um, during the experiment do you want the baby to live she said yes i want to deliver the baby what about you she said i want to live strange she never thought she could live or wanted to live and when she came out this was kind of told to her that you know you have decided for the baby to live this was the dilemma but you also mentioned that you want to live she says, yes after the experience i am beginning to think along those lines so what she did first thing she walked out changed her husband rather left her husband left her job left her changed her lifestyle and she lived on for another 20 30 years i mean till the book was being written she continued to live everything began to recede it's like there was a cry for change and deep within she connected that she wants a change so beautifully when somebody asked mother about you know dying and it's better i die uh, think in terms of self harm she said if you want to die yes die but die to your ego self but if you don't die to the ego self you will come back again with the same problem probably much worse problems and destiny finds its way you know someone who was uh, told that he is going to die of the sea so the father made sure that he'll keep the person away from the sea so one day he died of eating fish <laughs> it's a true story there are some strange things like that buddha was told that you know he will become a sanyasi so father kept him away from anything to do with spirituality and exposed him to excess of pleasure so look what happens excess of pleasure became a feeder for him so when he stepped out and first time as a grown up saw death he was shaken to the core had he grown up like any other normal person perhaps he would have just become a king his father ended up helping him by this kind of paradoxical so these are the ways destiny works so we should be very conscious of what we 
even think about others, about ourselves. We may not realize that, you know, it ha it's not somebody is hearing it. May not always, you know, when we say death is better, probably Yamaraj is, he is an overactive fellow. But he may just come nearby. There's a story like that, no? Somebody was calling, better I die. So Yamaraj came, you called me. He said, no, 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 I didn't, I'm sorry. No, no, you called me, I have come. You tell me now, you want to come with me, I'm so happy, nobody calls me. I, I love to be, you know, I'll take you in a friendly way. Say, no, sir, I have my children, grandchildren. You should be so careful. Basically, if we want to change these things, we must lead a conscious life. If we are unconscious of our own, um, uh, our own inner movements, then obviously we will be led unconsciously. Are an outcome of suppressed realities that hardly rise into material day because we are not conscious. And yet, the final thing he says, they are born from the spirit's son of hidden power, digging a tunnel through emergency. Sometimes, this is the course that destiny takes. You know, when um, this uh, lady who was um, regarded as a nightingale of Bengal died at 21 of uh, laryngeal cancer. So, Dilip Kumar Roy dashed a letter to Sri Why did such a fine flower fade away so soon? And he says he had already risen into, she had a very sattvic consciousness. And in this life, she couldn't have gone further. Because um, of various reasons. Sattva is a big bond to break. This bond of responsibility, this bond of, I am, you know, this is very difficult to break because it's all about good things. But her soul really wanted to pierce through it. And therefore, the only way was to leave the body and take upon a new body. So this is the uh, fundamental truth about, so when, the, when one asks, can destiny be changed? The answer is yes and no. And it's not a political or diplomatic answer. It depends on the state of consciousness and the poise of consciousness. In ordinary consciousness, the ordinary law applies to us. In the ordinary law, we are just a plaything and pawn in the hands of forces, a castaway or a plaything of time slots. And whether we blame them or we don't blame them, they are all the same because they just, Shubhendu uses the word, over, overseers of fate. They don't care a damn about, you know, that somebody will be pained or some heart is broken because that's needed for our evolution. Their purpose is to keep the evolutionary forces moving. Their purpose is not to give us comfort zones. So they will act. And we may fret and fume, we may build philosophies, we may become charvak, we may say, God doesn't exist, he's a cruel torturer, he'll say, all right, you may call me by whatever names. But when we begin to rise out of the ordinary consciousness, then we discover several levels of determinisms when we have a certain degree of empowerment, if not the ultimate empowerment. We can to an extent alter and intervene as we rise higher and higher. Then when we touch our soul, we discover the hidden meaning of fate. And if we can touch that which is beyond this time has, fate has works of time, then we can call an intervention and completely change the fate. So in this sense, freedom walks with each face of fate. Anything to share or anything to... Yes, please. Destiny? Yes, of course. Because nation is... The collective consciousness, eventually it will realize what it is born for. Like when it is said that India is born to be the spiritual guru of the world, it is going to realize. But what ups and downs will go through will depend upon the national consciousness. That's why people want to change a nation's destiny. It cannot come by political means. It will come by an awakening of national consciousness. This is what Chanakya knew and this is what Sri was doing. If you read through Sri writings, he was actually awakening the national consciousness. So the more we change the national consciousness, the more it will begin to align itself to its destiny. Third thing, so national consciousness is a big word, you know, but what do I, what can I do myself? So mother said, uh, with, unite with your soul, and love India with your soul, with your psychic being. And that will uh, do whatever little bit, whether it's a squirrel or a monkey, it will help in changing the nation's destiny. 
So uh, this is, should be the approach. Otherwise, we'll go through many upheavals, ups and downs, till eventually, eventually it will be fulfilled. There is that ultimate destiny where, where the soul has to express something and nobody can stop it, whether how many cycles of creation there are. But to make it uh, faster, make it smoother, with less suffering, each of us must uh, discover this truth inside and love the nation as a living goddess and every nation it applies to and seek to express its truth in our own life. That's why Shubhinto gives this recover the Aryan spirit. And then he says, not just in books, but in your own life. Recover the Vedas, recover the Upanishads, recover the Gita in your life and actions. So the more we recover it in our life and action, the more we will align, knowingly and unknowingly, India's destiny towards that. And it will apply to every nation, but I am speaking here in context of India. It has a destiny. That's uh, an illusion. So, sometimes one person who is, um, when, when mother was asked this, she said something very interesting. This is, uh, I think her conversation of, I may forget the date, uh, but she said that all that I need is one man. And then she said something very interesting. She said, there was a man and he had come for the inauguration of the school. You guess who was that man? But first let me tell you the whole passage. But he was killed. So assassinated. So the disciples says assassinated. She says oh they gave the official version. He went to Kashmir. He was killed. Though the official version was that he fell sick and died. Guess who was he? Shyama Prashad Mukherjee. She spoke of that. He said he was strong. She said that one man should be one who is open to Sri thought doesn't mean that he has to be a devotee. Open to that thought and should be strong in character. For all the other people who came, she said, okay, they are workable, but they are weak. These were her words about all the others who came. She said, they are very weak. So then, nice guys, good guys, not weak. When you speak of a nation, you need to be very strong in character. She said, there was one man. She describes him the tall person and everything. He went to Kashmir and he was assassinated. And it's about Sama Prashad Mukherjee. So, all that is needed is one man in a crucial place, in a critical place, and he can change destiny. You see what happened during Alexander's invasion, that one man was Chanakya. So, yeah. Chanakya is a part of the... Yeah. Chanakya has seen the spirit. Yeah. When it comes to that destiny, I have seen the spirit. Yeah. When it comes to him that it is leads to him that uh, Chandrakuta Maurya is uh, another king yeah. and Amartya Rakshas is going to be Amartya and he lives. So that he has achieved his uh, destiny or he has... Yeah, see, subsequent destiny unfolded itself. Ultimately, Chandragupta did, you know, the kingdom is known as Chandragupta's kingdom. And uh, Amatya Rakshas, if you really look into the um, uh, dynamics of Amatya Rakshas, he was not a bad person. He was just, uh, he had this little weakness. He actually, he wanted to be a, be, give good governance to his own people. He loved his people, but he was called Rakshasa because of his uh, dominating attitude. But he was a good guy and he was used for his purposes. So he was a good instrument but in bad hands. So that's how the whole thing worked. But eventually Chandragu, it was Chandragupta's dynasty which extended right. I mean Shobindo speaks of him as uh, he is immortalized when Shobindo says when Sri Krishna created a nation. Uh, if Sri Krishna wouldn't have uh, interceded then right with the advent of Kali everything would have degenerated. But he established a nation unit. He says he saved India with Mahabharata. And after that Countless kings kept that nation unit and he named some of them Ajat, Shatru, Chandragupta, Ashoka. They kept that nation unit together. So, it doesn't matter which man eventually comes outwardly. But the nation was, the destiny was secured at least for uh, the next uh, hundred years or so.